actor, the nice thing about writing is you have total control over your environment, so you can always change stuff around. I mean, the the you know, there's no law that you have to follow the outline completely. So I have this stuff mapped out, but then if I feel like the story will be better if I add stuff or subtract it or change it around, I just do You're it. You're not afraid to digress. Yeah, it's just, just a road. needs to go. It's a road map for me. So, right. you know, it, it, the way I describe when I'm talking to writing classes, if you just say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start driving it, and you just hop in the car without a plan, you could end up in the Mojave Desert out of gas and die. Now, you both uh, write courtroom uh, dramas, which seem to me have a lot of uh, immediate advantages. Um, it's very theatrical. It's got the tension of trying to find answers. So that's all set for you in that way. But what are some of the disadvantages to working in the courtroom, narratively? What um, do you think? Yeah, I've written, I guess, nine books in the courtroom. The courtroom comes alive for me. That's where the books tend to take off. And it's because of the dialogue. It's because it starts to read like a transcript. Um, and you can see the, the uh, tension that goes on. Um, you know, it's hard to say there's a disadvantage. For me, the disadvantage is the, I, I write in the first person, and the consequence is you're in the lawyer's head. And he's explaining things as he goes, and you get a lot of the color of life from, from his perspective. Um, so it can be narrow sometimes. But I got tired writing courtroom novels at one time, and I said, it must be easier to write in the third-person voice, the omniscient point of view. Let's take it out of the courtroom and have some action. And I found out that was just as hard as writing in the courtroom. And for me, it was even harder. Uh, I had, I had, I had a, you know, a six or 700-page manuscript to finish, and I had no courtroom scenes. And after about halfway through the manuscript, I was starting to lose confidence that I was going to be able to pull this off. It worked OK, because the stories were well plotted, and there was an opportunity for action. But, um, but by and large, the courtroom has uh, pretty much saved my, my story. So you have no, you just are very comfortable there, and it's oh, never, yeah. you don't yeah. ever think, God, get me out of this. No. No. <laughs> okay. no. And how about you? Yeah, I can't think of any disadvantage, because, right. you know, the courtroom presents a natural play. It's a, you yeah. have the two sides, good and evil in there, and then you've got all these mysterious goings on, and you know, one thing I want to comment on, I find it incredibly difficult. I can't write a novel in the first person. I've written 13 novels and I think four short stories. My short stories are all first person, but that's because they're really compact. And I think one of the neat things about Steve's books is that he's able to just use the one person's point of view and yet do so much. I can't do that, and what I like about using third person is I can have many different characters, I can have many different settings. Well, and traditionally, I, the, yeah. the thriller uses many different yeah. perspectives, so but, I, but you write exclusively in, in the first person? Yeah, yeah. yeah except the, th the three books that are outside the series are written in the third person. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the real disadvantage in, to writing in the first person is you can't have cutaway scenes. You can't leave them hang. Well. You can leave them hanging on a cliff, okay? You can leave your reader hanging on the edge of a cliff at the end of a chapter, but you have to do it in a different way. Um, whereas in, a, in, a, in an omniscient point of view, uh, you can show, you know, Uncle Charlie over here falling off the cliff and then cut to, you know, his son uh, who's back in an office somewhere talking to someone else and you leave the reader wondering for a chapter or two what happens to Uncle Charlie. Um, you can't do that uh, in, in, the, in the first person uh, voice. Uh, and so the consequence is it is somewhat limiting. It's, it's like uh, directing a film, and I tend to think uh, almost like a director does. Okay, I have to be able to visualize what's going on before I can write it. So I'm actually looking through the camera lens when I look through my protagonist's eyes. If he's not on stage, the readers can't know what's going on because they only exist inside my protagonist's head. So uh, One of my questions is going to be, you spend all this time training and schooling and and practicing and then only to leave it eventually and what would move you but maybe enough's enough after a while or just that writing was that much more of a draw I love being a criminal defense lawyer and I did 12 death penalty cases and I never ate ass and I ate a lot of ice cream and <laughs> stuff like that I got lucky I never lost a case so I mean a death case I never had anyone on death row when I was done with it but uh, all right, so here's but, a, but the, your question was, why did you leave? Why did you leave? Because I... Your wife kicked you out. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would still be practicing, but the book tours, I'm out of... Yeah. Once I got on the best soloist, they want you to go out on book But you tours. weren't going to put down the writing. You thought, I love it too much to, to say, I'll put it down and just go no, back to the writing to was a hobby for me. I, that was never serious about it. But then you had writing. to give it up to write. Give all oh, the law the stuff. Law, you had to give up the law in order to keep Because I'm out on the road, you can't tell you... You could have said to heck with the writing. 
Well, I could, but I was enjoying doing it. But uh, I, I, what, what that's the answer. Come on, <laughs> Phil. Tell them the money's better. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> no, I mean, by the, time, by the time I had a big guy, I had been practicing for 25 years. I'd basically done, done everything. everything. Okay. I'd argued the U.S. Supreme Court. So, so, and I never had a chance to be a full-time writer. So when you're out on the, you can't be out on the road three months and do a death case. You can't tell your client, gee, I know they want to execute you, but I've got to go to <laughs> You know, here's a copy of my book, you know. <laughs> it's really good, and if they start dragging you down the hall, you know, have your people call my people. You can't do it. So I made a, I made a decision that if, if, if you can't do these cases 100%, you have no business even starting. And, it was, and you enjoyed the writing enough that you were yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I've done this. And was so that similar for you, Steve? Oh, no. I never looked back. Oh, yeah? I, uh, I hung up my school. Well, see, I had been a journalist before I went to law school. And uh, as I was going to law school, I was, I was actually a journalist in the daytime and went to law school at night. So I always loved the writing first. It was therapeutic for me. And so when I had an opportunity to write, in fact, when I was practicing law, much of what I did was writing because I wrote briefs for other lawyers who couldn't write. So, um, you know, it's one of the things I did on the side. I practiced law in the daytime and then wrote briefs at night. When the briefs petered out and I didn't have that any longer, and, it, and in large, large part they ended because I was involved in a lengthy, protracted um, um, it was a $100 million bankruptcy case with another lawyer. When that ended, um, I needed to find something to do with my, with my weekends and nights, and I started writing my first novel. So, um, and I'd thought about fiction for many years and not done it, so I, I really never looked back. And what, so once they started off, you were very happy to move over. Uh, yeah, I, all I needed was enough money to quit my day job. Yeah. What advice yeah. would you give to some poor struggling lawyer who wants to become a full-time novelist? What I always tell students and lawyers who come up with this, say, well, I'm going to quit my job and be able, I say, what are you, nuts? But I always tell them that's the bad news. The good news is that you can't be a writer and do death penalty cases or brain surgery as a hobby but you can be a brain surgeon or a TV repairman or a bus driver or a lawyer and write as a hobby. So my advice I always says, if you really like writing and it's fun for you, do it. And then if you get lucky, like Steve and I got in a position where we can make a choice, then you can say, okay, I'm going to keep on being a bus driver or I'm not going to be a bus driver. The, the part of the problem is statistics are meaningless if you love doing something. Um, and so you have to start, first of all, by believing in yourself. Okay, if you don't have confidence that you can write something that's, uh, that's susceptible to publication, um, you'll never write anything. Okay, so you start with that dream. And that's what I did, basically. I, just, I was reading other people, I was reading their fiction, and I said, I could write something that's that, at least that good. And uh, these were successful authors. Now, I'm not sure, I was, you know, I was probably kidding myself, but um, you know, I have to say, at some point in time, I look back and I go, I'm on the bestsellers list with these people. You know, so uh, it took me a while to get there. You know, I, it wasn't, I didn't blow out of the box on the first book. Um, but, um, you know, it took me, I was fortunate, actually. I was very lucky uh, because the second book did touch the list. Um, but, you know, and some people can write eight or ten books before they get there, you know, but they get there. Um, and not, yet yeah, true. The statistics, you know, I mean, you could probably, you can probably win the lottery or have a better shot of winning the lottery than you can of making the New York Times bestsellers list uh, as, a, as an unknown uh, writer with a first book, but uh, but it does happen, you know. So that's why people buy lottery tickets. Mm -hmm.